My name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you are interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 284. Please turn to it. Page number 284, problem number 104 is what we are about to do. Let's take a look at it. Problem number 104. Let's see what it has to say. Now listen, before we actually do the problem, before we actually do the problem number 104, I want to make a note here before I forget it. I would like you to compare this problem. I would like to compare, compare this problem with data sufficiency question number 96 on page 283. On the previous page, number 96, problem number 96, if you have not watched the solution to that problem, watch the solutions to that problem and compare the two problems and you will, you will find it fruitful. You will, you, will, you, will find, you, will, you will get something out of it. Here's what it says. It says that we, if we see a number in the box like that, it is supposed to denote it is supposed to denote, it this denotes the the greatest the greatest integer the greatest integer that happens to be less than it happens to be less than or equal to x. And the question simply is is this number in the box equal to zero? That's very simple, very straightforward question. Is this quantity equal to zero? Now before we dive into it and before we actually start solving for it, we have to first understand what they are talking about. What does it mean here? If we see a number in the box, it, it represents the greatest integer that we can think of, the largest integer that we can think of without going over it, without going over it. That's what less than means. For example, what's the largest integer that you can think of, the largest possible integer that you can think of without going over 7, 8? We cannot go over 7, 8. It has to be less than 7, 8. It has to be less than or equal to the quantity that you see here. But the largest integer that you can think of without going over 7, 8 is 0. 0 is the largest integer that, that does the job here. Therefore, the answer to this question is, if x happens to be 7, then this quantity would be 0. Let's do one more. How about, how about 2 thirds? What do you suppose the largest integer that we can think of without going over 2 thirds? Well, without going over 2 thirds, if you look on the number line, the largest integer, here is, here is our 0, and here is our 1, and here is 1 third and 2 thirds, this is 2 thirds. The largest integer without going over 2 thirds is 0 again. Is again 0. Let's do one more. How about... I should have done this thing ahead of time, I forgot about it. And I need it now, so... I have to manufacture as I speak. My eraser, that is, you understand? These are custom made erasers. How about uh, 1 over 1000? 1 over 1000. What do you suppose the value of this guy is? 1 over 1000 is going to be right here. 1 over 1000. What's the largest integer that you can think of? What's the largest integer that we can think of without going over 1 over 1000? Again, that largest integer is to zero again. This is the largest integer without going over 1 over 1000. The largest integer is zero. Let's do one more, one last one. How about this guy? What's the largest integer that you can think of which happens to be either less than or equal to 3? But the largest integer that is that exists which happens to be either less than or equal to 3, is 3 itself. Do you understand? Now let's do the problem. In the first statement they tell us, let's take a look at the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that 5x plus 1 
equals to 3 plus 2x. Let's subtract 2x from both sides. Let's subtract 1 from both sides and we are done. 1 goes out. 5x minus 2x is going to be 3x and 2x are going to drop out and positive 3 and a negative 1 is going to be 2 and x equals to 2 thirds. Again, if you put a box around this guy, so then what we are asking ourselves is, what is the largest integer that happens to be equal to or less than 2 thirds? The largest integer that happens to be either less than or equal to 2 thirds is 0. So are we able to answer the question? The question, the question was, is this quantity equal to 0? The answer turns out to be yes. Yes, it is equal to 0. Again, as I always do, and I'm going to do it again one more time, the emphasis here is not on the fact that it turned out to be 0. That is not the bloody point. Even if this quantity had turned out to be 17, we still would have been just as happy. In which case, had that quantity turned out to be 17, we would have said, is this quantity equal to 0? We would have said, definitely not. We just have to be able to see, we just have to be able to say, definitely not or definitely yes. It does not matter whether the answer actually turns out to be affirmative. Do you understand? As I always remind you. Is Michael dead? Well, if it turns out that Michael is in fact dead as a dodo, we really don't give a damn. We are not attached to Michael. As long as we are able to say, yes, Michael is definitely dead, that does the job. We have to be able to give a definitive answer. Here we are able to give the definitive answer. It just happens to be an affirmative answer. The first statement by itself does the job quite nicely. First statement by itself does the job quite nicely. Therefore, A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself does the job nicely, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. Answer would have to be either A or D. We already have a 50-50 chance. Let's look at second statement. In the second statement that tells us, in the second statement that tells us that X is between 0 and 1. X is between 0 and 1. Let's take a look at it here. Here's our 0, here's our 1. X is between 0 and 1. Let's start with simplest scenario. What happens if X happens to be exactly half? If x happens to be exactly half, and we put a box around this thing here, what's the largest integer that happens to be less than or equal to half? The largest integer that uh, happens to be either less than or equal to half is 0. What if x happens to be 9 tenth? We put a 9 tenth, uh, we put a box around 9 tenth, we put a box around 9 tenth, the largest integer that we can think of, which is less than or equal to 9 tenth, is again 0. It's again 0. What if x happens to be 1 over 100? We just saw it a little while ago. The largest integer that is either less than or equal to 1 over 100 again is 0. So it turns out that it doesn't matter where x falls between 0 and 1, as long as for x falls, as long as, long as the value of the x falls between 0 and 1, it doesn't matter what the actual value turns out to be of the x, we are always able to give a definitive answer here. Is this quantity zero? To which we will say yes, yes, and yes. Second statement does the job quite nicely as well. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's move on to second problem, shall we? Let's move on to 105. I need a break. Just give me one second. One hundred and five. In 105, we are told A cost A cost three dollars per kilo. We are told that B cost five dollars per kilo. We have a mixture of ten kilo, consisting of X kilo of A and y kilo of b. The question is, is, is x more than y? Very simple, very straightforward question. As I always remind you, as I always point out, the questions most of the times do tend to be quite straightforward and simple. It is the answers in the, quant in the data sufficiency questions that, that tend to be prickly. Let's look at the first statement. The first statement tells us the first statement tells us that the y is more than 4. y is more than 4. We need the room, so we need to erase all of this thing. Well, if y is more than 4, 
if y is more than 4 and we know that the total has to be exactly 10 kilos and if y is more than 4 then x would have to be less than 6 x would have to be less than 6 let's look at some scenarios shall we we have to meet these two conditions y we are told is more than 4 y we are told is more than 4 which means the x must be less than 6 let's look at a couple of scenarios and see if we are able to answer this question is x more than y let's see what we can do simply knowing that x is less than 6 and y is more than 4 we'll see what happens so here's our y which is more than 4 and here is our x which is less than 6 let's start with the simplest scenario simplest possible scenario is where they both happens to be where they both happen to be 5 simplest possible scenario don't make it too complicated don't make it too complicated as you can see here as you can see if y happens to be 5 well then y is more than 4 and if x happens to be 5 then x is less than 6 we are meeting both of these conditions but as you can see if this were the scenario then the answer to this question is x more than y the answer is no the answer here is no let's look at one more case what happens if x happens to be uh, what happens if y happens to be oh, all we have to all we have to all we have to fulfill here the only condition we have to fulfill is that it is more than 4 or perhaps it is just slightly more than 4 maybe if it is slightly more than 4 but we don't even we don't even have to make it that complicated we don't have we don't have to go through the trouble of making it 4.1 or 4.001 let's make it simple how about four and a half if y happens to be four and a half in which case x would have to be five and a half x would have to be five and a half because we have to add up to ten the mixture is ten pounds mixture is ten kilos rather mixture is ten kilograms so they have to add up to ten as again in this case as you can see x is less if x happens to be less exactly five and a half kilos then x is less than six we met that condition and if y is four and a half then y is more than four but here we can clearly see that x x being five and a half is indeed greater than y here it was not so the question, answer to this question is x more than y well in this scenario the answer is no in that scenario the answer is yes we are not able to give a definitive answer we are not able to give a definitive answer the first statement by itself does not do the job the first statement by itself is not sufficient a d b c e a d b c e now that we have established the first statement by itself is not sufficient we know now the answer cannot be a or d it would have to be either b c or e let's look at second statement shall we let's look at second statement we need the room obviously Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that the cost of the 10 kilo, the cost of the mixture that is, cost of the mixture, which we know is 10 kilo, is less than 40 dollars. Well, what would be the cost of the mixture? Well, it's three dollars per kilo for x x x kilos. We buy x kilos of A. So the cost of A would be the cost of A would be the cost of A would be the X kilos that we are buying times three dollars that's how many dollars it is and the cost of B would be well if you are buying X kilos if you are buying X kilos of X then Y would have to be 10 minus X because we are buying a total of 10 kilos so that that's the second symbol that they gave you here that was actually silly if this if this if the mixture weighs 10 kilos and if we, have, if we have x kilo of one material then it stands to reason that the second material must weigh whatever is remainder 10 minus x kilos 10 minus x kilos and how much does it cost? it costs five dollars and their sum has to be less than forty let's get rid of the, let's get rid of the dollar sign let's see what we can do with this shall we? I'm going to rewrite this thing I don't like the five at the, at the, uh, on the other side let's write it here this way so it's easy to distribute it like this so here we get 3x plus 5 times 10 which is 50 and 5 times x which is 5 minus negative 5x which is less than 40 we add them up 3x and a negative 5x we get negative 2x bring the 50 to the other side subtract 50 from both sides if we subtract 50 from both sides 50 drops out 50 drops out I shouldn't have shouldn't have done all of this thing because now it causes confusion 
we're just bringing 50 to this side. Subtract 50 from both sides, so it's 40 minus 50 is going to be negative 10. And since this is negative 2 is less than negative 10, if you were to, if you were to divide both quantity by negative, if you were to divide both quantity by negative 2, well, keep in mind, whenever you divide an inequality by a negative number, the direction of the inequality changes. For example, for example, uh, 6 is less than 8, 6 is less than 8, if you were to divide both sides by 2, you're fine. But if you were to divide 6 by negative 2, 6 divided by negative 2 is negative 3. And negative 3 now is greater than negative 4. The direction of the inequality must be switched if you are about to divide by a negative number when you're dealing with inequality. You must keep that in mind. So we're going to divide both sides by negative 2. And if we divide both sides by negative 2 and this by negative 2, the directions will have to be switched. And x is more than 5. This tells us that x is more than 5. Well, if x is more than 5, if x is more than 5, and since the total is 10 kilos, what is it? Right here. The total is 10 kilos. If the total of the mixture is 10 kilos, and we just found out that x is more than 5, then why would this imply that y would have to be? This implies, this implies that y would have to be less than 5. If x is more than 5, then, uh, then x would have to be, uh, if x is more than 5 kilos, then y would have to be less than 5 kilos, because they have to add up to 10. And the question was, is x more than y? The answer is yes, x is more than y, because x is more than 5 kilos, and y is less than 5 kilos. So second statement does the job quite nicely. The answer is B. The second statement does enable us to answer the question, the question being, did we buy more of the x than the y? The answer is yes, we did. We must have bought more than 5 kilos of x, and therefore less than 5 kilos of y, because they add up to a total of 10 kilo of mixture. Let's look at the next next problem, shall we? I need a break one more time. Just give me five seconds. Next one. Number 106. We are told that x is one mile ahead of y. The question is how long how long before how long before x is two miles ahead. We are told that he is one mile ahead of y. How long does it take before how long does it take before he is two miles ahead? That's the question. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that x goes 50 miles an hour and y goes 40 miles an hour. Well, if x goes 50 miles an hour and y goes 40 miles an hour, if we were to put the two statements together, so the only logical conclusion that we come to arrive that we arrive at is that x gain 10 x gains 10 miles on y every hour. Every hour x catches up with y 10 miles. The difference is 10 miles per hour. The difference is 10 miles per hour. Which means in, in one hour which means that in, in one hour x gains 10 miles on y. Well, if x gains 10 miles on y, if x gains 10 miles on y every hour, which is same as saying that every 60 minutes, every 60 minutes. So if it takes them 60 minutes to get it to go, to catch up 10 miles, he only has to catch up one mile before he was. He has to do. He just has to be one more miles ahead before he was one mile ahead. The question is, how long before he's going to be two miles ahead? In order for him to add another mile to his lead. Well, every hour he adds 10 miles to his lead. Every hour he gets 10 miles ahead of the other guy. Well, one mile should take six minutes. This implies that one mile, one additional mile will take six minutes. The first statement does the job quite nicely. This was a quite straightforward question. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, Answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D because the guy is taking an hour to 
to, to, to add 10 miles to his lead, therefore one mile will take one tenth, one tenth of an hour, that's all. Let's look at second statement, shall we? Let's look at second statement. Let's do second statement right here. Second statement tells us that three minutes ago, three minutes ago, X was half a mile ahead. Well, if three, if three minutes ago he was half a mile ahead, and now he's one mile ahead, we are told that now he's one mile ahead. Well, if he's one mile ahead of Y now, and three minutes ago he was only half a mile ahead, which tells us that in three minutes time he can add half a mile to his lead. This implies that in three minutes, in three minutes, X can add half a mile to his lead. But if he can add half a mile to his lead in three minutes, well then how long will it take him to add one mile to his lead? He has a one mile lead. Question is how long does it take? How long does it take before he has a two mile lead? Well, he wants to add one more miles to his lead, and we just found out that it takes him three minutes to add half a mile to his lead. Well, it will take him six minutes, obviously. Same as before. As I always point out, the informations in the two statements never contradict each other, as long as your work is correct. Listen very carefully. One more time. I'm breaking into the sermon. If the first statement, if, if you arrive at the conclusion from the first statement that it takes him six minutes to add one miles to his lead, and you do the work in the second statement, and all of a sudden you arrive at the conclusion that it takes now x something other than six six minutes uh, to 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 add one miles to his lead. If the first statement told you that it takes six minutes to add one miles to his lead, and the second statement tells you something other than six minutes, something has gone wrong drastically. Either your work in the first statement was not correct, or your work in the second statement is not correct, or Neither of the work that you did in the two statements were correct, but they cannot both be correct. They are either both incorrect or one of, or one of them is not correct. They never contradict each other. Do you understand? Let's be found out here. In three minutes, he can add half a mile. So in six minutes, this implies that in six minutes, in six minutes, he can add one mile to his lead. In six minutes, he can add one miles to his lead just like before. Second statement also does the job quite beautifully. The answer is D. The answer is D. Let's move on then. Number 107. Number 107. Let's see what we have there. Number 107. Okay. Just give me one second again. One hundred and seven. We are told that cart cartoon, rather cartoon film, consists of seventeen thousand two hundred and eighty frames. The question is, how long is the Film. How many minutes that is? How many minutes will it take? How many minutes will it take to run this film if it happens to contain 17,280 frames? Let's see what they tell us, shall we? Statement one. In the statement one, they tell us that the speed, the speed is 24 frames, not 40, but 24. 24 frames per second. 24 frames per second. As we should be able to see right away that this information is quite sufficient. We, they just gave us the speed. It takes it takes one second to run 24 frames. Well if it takes one second to run 24 frames obviously we can figure out how long it will take, how many seconds it will take to run this many frames. Just divide that quantity 17,280 by 24 and that will give us how many seconds it takes. And then we convert it to the minute. The first statement does the job quite nicely. A D B C E A D B C E. Now that we have established that the first statement by itself does the job quite nicely, we know now that the answer cannot be 
B, C or E. It will have to be either A or D. Now, had it been a real exam, this is all we have done. This is all we would do in the real exam. This is all we, we, we would have done in the real exam. Had it been a real exam, we would just move on to the second statement like we were about to. But this is not a real exam. We are here for practice. We are here to sharpen our skill. So for that purposes, purely for learning purposes, we're going to do the work which in real exam would always be, as I remind you, which, which I always remind you, would be sheer waste of time. This is not something we'll do in a real exam. We'll actually figure out how long it takes. Do you understand? Just for learning purposes. Let's find out, shall we? So it's just going to, as I said, it's going to be 17,280 divided by 24. But how do we know? How do we know if a number is divisible by 4? Do you know? Do you know how to figure out if the number is divisible by 4? A number is divisible by 4 if the last two digits of a number is divisible by 4. For example, for example, for example, 714, 714 is not divisible by 4. 714 will not divide evenly by 4 because the last two digits are 14 and you can't divide 14 by 4 evenly. 716, 716 is divisible by 4. Why? Because 16 is divisible by 4 and so is the 700. Now how do we know the 700 is divisible by 4? Only the last two digits play the role. Only the last two digits play the role in determining whether or not the number is divisible by 4 because we know 100 is divisible by 4. We know that 100 is divisible by 4. There are 25 fours in 100. Well, if 100 is divisible by 4, then so is 200, and so is 300, and so is any multiple of 100. So any digits after that is going to be all multiples of 100 or 1000 or 10,000, and they are all divisible by 4. The only two digits we have to worry about are the last two digits. The last two digits here happen to be 80. 80 is divisible by 4 and so is 24. Let's divide by 4. I gave you all this long lecture. You might, you might, you're probably thinking it would have been quicker just to divide by 2 and just divide by 2 again. You're right. It would have been quicker, but it's good to know that, that, uh, that we are able to tell right away if our number is divisible by 4, which it is. So we're going to divide it by 4. Okay, let's see what happens. How many 4s in the 17? How many 4s in the 17? 17 has 4 4s. Four 4s four are 16. 4 4s are 16. The remaining one goes and joins the 2 becomes 12. How many 4s in a 12? 12 has 3 4s. How many 4s in a 8? 8 has 2 4s. How many 4s in a 0? Well, 0 has no 4s. And how many 4s in a 24? The answer is 6. And now we see that 4 plus, 4 plus 2 is 6 and then we have a 3. 4 plus 2 is 6, 6 plus 3 is 9. And now we know that now we apply the rule for 3. We know that if the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, then the number itself is divisible by 3. The sum of the digits here is 2 plus, uh, 2 plus 4, which is 6 plus 3 is 9. 9 can be divided by 3, therefore this number can be divided by 3. We're going to divide 2 and top and bottom by 3, even though we could very easily divide by, by 2. But then we'll, what do we divide by? Actually, I changed my mind. How do we know if a number is divisible by 6? Listen very carefully. How can we tell if a number is divisible by 6? Well, in order, for us, in order for you to tell if a number is divisible by 6, it's a two-step process. First, uh, for a number to be divisible by 6, first it has to be divisible by 2. Any number that is divisible by 6 must also be divisible by 2. In other words, it must be an even number. For example, for example 15, 15 is divisible by 3, but it is not divisible by 2 because it's an odd number. And therefore, 15 is divisible by 3, but it is not divisible by 6. On the other hand, on the other hand, 18 is an even number, which means it is divisible by 2, and 1 plus 8 is 9, 9 is divisible by 3. Since this number is divisible by 3 and 2, this number is also divisible by 6. This is an even number. This is an even number. And the sum of the digit is 9, which means this number is divisible by 6. Instead of doing it in a two-step process, let's do it in one step. Let's divide top and bottom by 6. How many 6 and 43? Or rather, let's start the process properly. Let's start the process properly. How many 6s in 4? 4 has no 6s. 4 has no 6s. That 4 goes and joins the 3, becomes 43. How many 6s in 43? 43 is 7, 6, or 42. It's going to have 7 6s. 7 6 of 42. The remaining one goes and joins the 2 becomes 12. How many 6s in 12? 
12. How many 6 and a 0? Zero? 0 is no 12. Voila. It will take a grand total of 620 seconds to run the 620 seconds to run the film. It will take a grand total of 620 seconds to run the film. 620 seconds, of course, we know is same as 600 seconds plus 120 seconds, obviously. This is 10 minutes and this is 2 minutes. Turns out it will take a total of 12 minutes to run the film. It will turn, it, it turns out that it will take a total of 12 minutes to run the film. But all of this work that we just did was a waste of time, would have been a waste of time had it been a real exam. We would not, we would not have been so damn silly to actually do it out had we been taking the real exam right now. You understand that? Let's look at the second statement, shall we? The first statement does the job quite nicely. As we, as we knew from the very beginning, as long as we have the speed, we can figure out the amount of time. Just divide that number by 24 and figure out how many seconds. And once we know the seconds, convert it into hours. Let's look at the second statement. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement by itself was enough. Answer cannot be B, C, or E. Second statement, let's see if, if there is anything worthwhile that they tell us in the second statement. Otherwise, the answer will be A, if the second statement turns out to be useless. It tells us that it takes six times, six times as long to run the film as it does to rewind the film. Alright. And they also tell us that the total amount of time, I just make sure I'm reading it correctly here, and they also tell us that the total amount that it takes, and it takes a total of 14 minutes to do both. They go on to say that it takes a total of 14 minutes. It takes 14 minutes total. It takes a total of 14 minutes to run the film and to rewind it. After you watch the entire film, you wait for it to rewind itself, and the entire process of running the film and rewinding itself, the entire process we are told it takes 14 minutes. So let's, let's, let's set it up. So here is the here is the run time, and here is the rewind time, run and rewind, and we are told that it takes six times as long to run. So the ratio ratio is six to one. Well, six to one is seven. Six, 6 to 1 is a total of 7. 6 to 1 is a total of 7. Which means since it takes 14 minutes together, then it just must be this times times 2 and times 2. It takes 12 minutes to run it and 2 minutes to rewind it. Now again, you see that? It takes 12 minutes to run it because that is exactly what we found in the first statement. They never contradict the two statements, the information in the two statements that, you, that is given. They never contradict. If you found out that the first step, if you found out from the work that you did in the first statement that it took, it takes 12 minutes to run the film, and then you do your work in the second statement, it turns out that it takes 14 minutes to run the film, but something has gone wrong. If it tells you something other than 12 minutes, then something has gone wrong, either in the first statement that you did the work, or the work you did in the second statement, or as I pointed out before, or maybe both of the, both of the work that you did, both in statement 1 and statement 2, maybe they were both wrong, but they cannot be both right. As you can see, they confirm each other, they substantiate each other. The first statement told us that it takes 12 minutes to run the film, and that is exactly what we arrived here. It takes a total of 12 minutes to run the film, it takes a total of 2 minutes to rewind the film, hence the total of 14 minutes for the entire procedure. The answer is D. The second statement does the job quite nicely as well. The answer for this problem is D. I'm debating whether or not I want to do one more. Let's, let's stop right here, okay? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.